I'm Michael Apple. Welcome to this very special interview with Athol Williams, a former ethics lecturer at UCT. He worked for U.S. consultancy firm Bain and Company as a part-time partner serving on the Bain Africa Oversight Board. He blew the whistle in 2019, implicating Bain and Co. in the ransacking of our revenue service SARS, a perfectly orchestrated project found by the commission to be headed by former President Jacob Zuma and his hand-picked commissioner, Tom Moyane. Mr. Williams fled South Africa in early November 2021, fearing for his life. Uh, I just want to lay the foundation, Mr. Williams, for our discussion, so bear with me. The Zonda report looked at the purging of competent top officials, strategic positioning of compliant individuals, restructuring and deliberate weakening of institutional functions, and a climate of fear and bullying at the revenue service. The report notes uh, that the use of uh, your former employers, let's put it that way, Bain and Co. in this instance, were used to justify changes that were necessary to advance the capture of SARS. At what point, what was the final straw, Mr. Williams, that, uh, that led you to believe that these people were actively seeking to destroy the competence of SARS? So, Michael, I wasn't at Bain when Bain worked at SARS. Um, I, you know, I was brought in in 2018 to, under the auspices of them wanting to make amends in the country. But what led me to eventually leaving Bain and blowing the whistle was when I became convinced um, of two things. One, Bain was withholding information from me, from the public, and from the authorities about what it knew about what happened at SARS and other state institutions where it worked. And secondly, was that Bain's focus was on protecting its business in the US rather than doing the right thing in South Africa. And so the focus for Bain became um, evasion, obfuscation of just giving South Africa the bare minimum rather than full disclosure and rather, rather than doing the right thing, which was my interest. That's why I got involved with Bain in 2018 was because they had told me they wanted to fix and make amends for what they had done to SARS. Yeah, they were looking to plaster over the cracks in their public image stemming from the Nugent Commission. And the State Capture Inquiry is the second commission to make very damning findings against them. I just want to go to what the Zondo report, this part one, has said. And I'd like your thoughts on particular issues and just to explain why they're problematic. So it, it, it found that certain uh, Bain executives, uh, Mr. Massoni, I think Vittorio Massoni, was meeting with uh, Mr. Tom Moyane way ahead of the fact before he was appointed uh, head of SARS as the commissioner. Why would something like that be problematic? Um, so, Michael, in and of itself, it's not problematic, right? You can meet with whoever we want. Um, it's, it's when you look at some of the details of the, the circumstances around which Mr. Massoni and some of his colleagues were meeting with, with Tom Moyani. The, the first circumstance that's relevant is that as early as October 2013, so that's a full year before Mr. Moyani is appointed as the commissioner, he, Mr. Moyani, was given the assurance from President Zuma that he would be the new commissioner of SARS. That's even before the full recruitment process had completed. So Mr. Moyani knew he was going to be the commissioner, given the assurance from the president. Secondly, Mr. Moyani and Mr. Zuma had informed Bain of that decision. And, and so this is what makes it massively problematic, because these parties knew it was going to happen. And um, furthermore, they'd been meeting Bain, Mr. Moyani, uh, President Zuma, to begin to develop a plan for what would happen when Mr. Moyani got into SARS. Bain then spends up, up to a year investing time and massive resources working with Mr. Moyani to develop this detailed plan of what is going to happen when he gets to SARS. And that's what makes that problematic. This wasn't casual meetings. This wasn't a meeting just to, to meet and greet. These were 
meetings to begin the planning. And the planning is what is shocking because for people outside of SARS to plan the level of detail that Bain and Moyani did plan, um, first it shows that they were getting information from inside SARS coming to them. So there was a deep throat called Jonas Makwakwa. And, and, and secondly, that the intent becomes clear. The intent says that they were going to restructure SARS no matter what. Even before they got in there, before they even did this, this sham diagnostic, the, the intent was always to disable certain functions and to restructure SARS. Well, my, my question, and that leads perfectly into this, is SARS was among the top five revenue and customs authorities in the world. I assume that this was inconvenient to state capturers in the country. Absolutely. Um, and there's been lots of speculation about why um, the state capturers would want to go after SARS. Um, was it to loot SARS directly? Was it part of their strategy to get hold of Treasury? Was it to disable particular law enforcement capabilities within SARS so that tax dodgers could keep dodging tax? And I think it's some combination of all those reasons. Yeah, uh, the report notes that this sort of systemic decline of SARS didn't happen overnight. It, it, it was presided over by the ANC, the ANC cadres, and the report states, quote, either they did not care or they slept on the job or they had no clue what to do. And these are people who are supposed to provide oversight. Um, it, it was obviously to their benefit to have a dysfunctional revenue collector. Uh, that much is clear. And you talk about this sort of sham refresh. Bain had a lovely word for it, profound strategy refresh. Now, you must roll your eyes at this because there was absolutely no need for this grand plan. Was it all simply a masquerade? You know, Michael, those words, as, as a career management consultant, and, and I was a partner at Bain, I started uh, with Bain in 1995, um, we would never use those words, a profound strategy refresh, because of what it implies. If you are going to go and do this profound strategy refresh of any organization, it means it's a complete do-over. It means that the, com the organization is dysfunctional, um, nothing is working, and no amount of tweaking is going to solve the problem. It needs to be almost you know, taken apart and put back together again. And of course, that's exactly what Bain and Moyani had intended. But the fact that this was the plan at the outset, for me, is completely shocking. Because there's, there's no right-minded person in the world who would say that SARS was dysfunctional. In fact, as you said, it was one of the top five tax collection agencies in the world. So... Bain's argument is, well, they found problems at SARS, and so therefore they had to restructure. And, and I've got to say, that is just an you know, a, a, a absolutely despicable explanation, because, of course, every organization has opportunities for improvement. Um, but that's where you go and improve a process. You perhaps hire a few extra people. You introduce new IT, perhaps. Um, there's very rarely, as a management consultant myself, I know that restructuring is always your last resort. It's only once you've tried everything else to improve the organization do you actually go and restructure. Yet, before Bain or Moyani even got to SARS, the decision already was made to restructure. And for me, this just shows the intent. This was not a consulting project where they went in, saw the problems, designed a solution. They arrived with a solution already designed. You know, I read with a mixture of amusement and horror about uh, Bain's development uh, partners in South Africa, Ambro Bright, who ironically yeah. had a fraudulent tax certificate. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Did Bain simply see millions of rands in revenue and use this bogus front company to get access to politically connected individuals? And who was Ambro Bright close to? So it was absolutely a, a, an attempt to buy their way into political circles. Um, Amber Bright um, is not even an operating company, never was an operating company. Uh, it was, um, I imagine, something bought, bought off the shelf um, on the day it was needed. And it was supposedly run by two individuals, Duma Mblovu, who's a creative artist and TV producer, 
and uh, Mandla Kanozulu, who's also an, an artist. So you've got these two artists who are now supposedly offering strategy advice to one of the world's preeminent strategy consulting firms um, on how to do just ordinary you know, business development in South Africa. It's preposterous, isn't it? But of course, we know, and Bain knew all the way up. This wasn't a South African issue at Bain. This was all the way up to Boston, its global head office. In its global head office, they knew the reason for engaging with Amber Bright, with Duma and Lovu, was because of his proximity to Jacob Zuma. They basically opened the doors to Jacob Zuma, and I presented documented evidence to the Zonda Commission that show every one of those meetings that Bain had with Jacob Zuma, Mr. Duma and Lovu was present. Yeah. At some other point, Bain itself becomes concerned about what's called the sunshine test. Can you explain to our community what the sunshine test is? So the sunshine test was uh, internal sort of um, lingo for, um, I, I guess, setting a, an ethical uh, bar. And, and so the, 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 the test was always, if what we are doing became public knowledge, would we be proud of that? Would we think it stands up to scrutiny? And, and I, I, I think it's an admirable way to think about things. And I, I loved the, that question of the, of the sunshine test, because you know, when, you, when you believe you're never going to be caught out, um, you, you, know, you have a different way of behaving than if you think, oh my goodness, if this gets public, um, you know, how will we defend it? And so Bain applies this sunshine test to things. And of course, at global level, at the head office in Boston, there was concern about the sunshine test of Bain's involvement with, uh, with Jacob Zuma, with Duma and Lovu. Um, and it fails the sunshine test. Um, and in a bizarre way, it still proceeds. And there's a very interesting question um, that Bain wants to avoid, which is who approved that contract? Who approved this relationship with Jacob Zuma? Who approved the strategy for using Amber Bright to get to Jacob Zuma? And, and Bain wants us to believe it was Mr. Massoni, but that's nonsensical. The contract went all the way up to Boston to head office. It was approved at Bain's global head office in Boston. You know, there would be 17 meetings between Bain and Mr. Zuma over two years, every six weeks. Um, to gain that sort of access to a head of state, you've got to be selling something good or of interest or of benefit to the president. Is that what they were doing? You know, Bain claims that those were marketing meetings, um, which, which again, you know, the way they consistently insult South Africans' intelligence is, is astounding because um, they're now trying to discredit the Zonda Commission. They've discredited the Nugent Commission. They're trying to discredit me. It's never about them. It's always about everyone else doing these wrong, bad things. But they're telling us that those were marketing meetings. Now, I think it's, it's highly problematic that any business consultant is, is meeting with the president. You've got an American company headed by an Italian meeting with our president to discuss the ANC's manifesto, to discuss how parliament is run, to discuss reshaping and repurposing our, our institutions. That's highly problematic. It's even quite unusual. Well, not quite. It's, it's very unusual, Michael, even for a management consultant ordinarily to be meeting with politicians. Bain is a management consulting business, a business consulting business. We meet with CEOs, boards of directors. Um, if you're going to do something in government, you would, you would meet with the minister, perhaps, but import, probably the DG of a, of a department. That's where you would be meeting to work and focus on improving those organizations. The fact that we were meeting with a corrupt president, um, as you, you sort of insinuate, um, is absolutely because you're selling something that that president uniquely is interested in. And, you know, there, there's, there's this phrase that Bain um, uses called president's projects. Um, a number of the projects they want, they, they keep saying, we should get this to be uh, designated a president's project. And what I discover from Bain's documents is if it's des designated a president's project, meaning Zuma takes a personal interest in it, they can bypass the normal governance processes. 
They don't even have to go to the minister. They can go straight to the president. So this shows, again, this level of intimacy of planning. Um, designated a president's project, Jacob Zuma takes a personal interest um, in it, um, and therefore you can bypass normal governance in doing what you were doing. Now, as you've mentioned, Bain would get involved in the ANC's manifesto, plans to restructure SA's economy, centralize procurement, allowing this level of involvement of a foreign consultancy firm uh, points to plans for much greater involvement than just Telcom, where they would get a billion rand, let's say, and SARS 167 million rand with interest, 217 million rand that they paid back. But I mean, they were they were aiming big here with all of their grand plans. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm glad you raised that, Michael, because often we, we've become a bit obsessed with just focusing on what, on what happened at SARS. Bain worked across all of our state institutions. They were at Telcom, as you say, at Development Bank of South Africa, the IDC, PIC, um, across the board. And uh, the, the, the fees they earned ran into the multiple billions. But, but frighteningly, it was when they looked ahead um, at these plans to restructure our entire state institutions, that's where Bain was seeing tens of billions of rands for decades to come. And, and that's why Masoni was celebrated as a hero within Bain. Um, globally, within the Bain system, Masoni was seen as a hero. At the worldwide partner meeting, for example, he was called up onto the stage and celebrated for cracking it in South Africa, for being intimate with the president, for being involved in you know, generating revenues that um, was among the highest in Bain's global system. And, and this is why he, he stayed as head of Bain's office in South Africa for a record nine years. Bain does not keep a head of an office that long. Across the system, this was the longest serving managing partner ever in Bain's system. Why? Because he was doing the unthinkable. He'd got intimate with the president and he was going to restructure the entire economy. Um, so again, this idea of Bain saying, well, you know, Masoni was this lone rogue, bad apple. We had no idea what he was doing. It's absolute nonsense. This is part of a coordinated strategy endorsed by his bosses in, in Boston. Yeah, he'd hooked the biggest fish there was to hook. Absolutely. So, um, I want to read an extract from the report, which shows that Mr. Zuma was not involved at arm's length, as he so often is. Quote, President Zuma was himself directly and personally involved in the activities and plans to take over a government entity, namely SARS. That's extraordinary that he's been so closely linked to the evisceration of, well, I'm not going to say his own tax uh, revenue service, but certainly one that is supposed to serve the interests of the country. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's the power of, of that evidence I was able to present to the commission. Um, it was, I think, for the first time we could put Jacob Zuma in the room, so to say, um, with those who were designing and executing parts of the state capture plan. And, and, and I think that's also important, Michael, that we recognize that Bain should not be lumped with all the other companies involved in state capture. They, 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 they sit apart because they were Jacob Zuma's consultant of choice. They sat with him at the table, at the highest table, planning state capture, so while many of the others obviously are guilty for being involved, but they're involved in the execution parts of it, there's only one firm who sat with Jacob Zuma, with the corrupt politicians, with the corrupt business people, who, by the way, still hold prominent positions in our society today, um, but they sat with them planning this. And I think that's why we need to be worried about the fact that they continue to operate in our country. You are saying they're co-conspirators. These are not unwitting, unknowing participants in state capture. <laughs> you know, again, I, I, I'm glad that what I presented to the Zonda Commission wasn't my opinion. It wasn't what I heard. It was based on documents that I had. That I had. Bain documents, documents I got from Bain or from their their supposed independent lawyers, Baker McKenzie. And these documents show that there was this was a coordinated plan, that um, the, the strategy was known and endorsed all the way up to Boston. Um, so this is not unwitting. Unwitting is, 
is Bain's PR spin to try and deflect from what they've done. The, the truth is, it was an explicit strategy. You know, Massoni says things to his boss, Paul Meehan, who um, was and still is in London. He says things like, we were tested by the president at Telcom, and now we're moving on to SARS, right? Um, we discussed with the president what his plan is, and we, Bain, are intimate, um, a key part of this plan. So this is not this is not uh, discussions about you know unwittingness. This is um, explicit knowledge that you are part of the plan. That your, your strategy is working because this was what you intended, and they were then getting on and implementing it. I want to speak about the various units. It was eventually dubbed the SARS Rogue Unit, but there were many units. The High Risk Intervention Unit. Uh, people like Johann von Lochenberg, um, dedicated, very skilled. Um, executives within SARS who were targeting the illicit economy. They were, which was a hundred billion uh, rand economy, the illicit economy in South Africa. Now, I want to ask you if the most senior people in government and the ANC were involved in blocking these efforts from these units, trying to shut them down, what conclusion should one draw from that? The best conclusion I think a reasonable person can draw is that anyone who wanted to shut down those units had something to hide because they were worried that those units would find this information they wanted hidden. And what did they want to hide but you know, information that points to their direct or, or their affiliates' involvement in that illicit trade. Um, and, and that's what's... Again, I say what any reasonable person would do, if you look at, look at what's happened, um, the fact that that unit, which, um, as Johann von Lockenberg describes, was developed over many years to, to become sophisticated enough and have the right skills to go after these illicit traders, because these are often organized criminals, these illicit traders. You needed very sophisticated people to track them and, and go after them. To, to the fact that that was targeted, both in the media in terms of the rogue unit narrative, but also it targeted directly at SARS in terms of decimating this unit. It was so obvious that there was something to be hidden. And so take out, take out the people who would come and um, you know, look for that hidden information. Here's another extract. Quote, the SARS evidence is a clear example of how the private sector colluded with the executive, including President Zuma, to capture an institution that was highly regarded internationally and render it effective. So you have the findings from the Nugent Commission, the state capture inquiry, yet somehow business leadership South Africa had no problem re readmitting Bain as a member after it was initially suspended in 2018, but it was allowed back into the fold. Your reaction to that? It's astounding. I mean, it's absolutely astounding. It, it shows this, this profound ethical poverty among the board leaders, the board members of Business Leadership South Africa, um, that these 12 people who are CEOs of some of the biggest companies in our country sat around a table knowing everything that we know about what Bain has done at, at, at SARS and elsewhere, knowing what the Nugent Commission has said, knowing what the Zondo Commission has said, knowing what I've written to them and, 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 and um, um, informed them about and concluded that this was a company that was worthy of being inside their organization, for me, just says that for society, we should now be worried about what's happening at Business Leadership South Africa. Because if, if they know Bain was a criminal at, um, organization, I mean, Busi Mabuso, the CEO of BLSA, actually goes further than the Zonda Commission, because the Zonda Commission said Bain acted unlawfully. Busi Mabuso says Bain committed serious crimes, her words. Now, for me, Michael, if I'm the CEO of a reputed organization and one of my members has committed serious crimes, for me, they'd be outraged firstly, and I would insist, I would, I would expel them immediately and insist on prosecution. Yet what BLSA does is go on a massive public campaign to defend them, to say, don't look at what they've done in the past. Let's look at what they've, the reforms they've made about the future of the organization, which is completely irrelevant when you consider what they've done. Um, and so it shows that BLSA are willing to embrace criminal activity um, 
um, a massive indictment on our private sector and, and the lack of ethical principled leadership in that organization. So, Mr. Moyane, Mr. Zuma, Bain executives, uh, Mr. Vittorio Massone, all who seemingly cooked this whole saga up, they're all walking free. They've ruined lives. Uh, they've decimated the South African Revenue Service and many the, the careers of many executives there. What do you want to see happen? I think I want to see what every decent South African wants to see. We need to see our, our law enforcement and our criminal justice system uh, do what it's meant to do, which is to prosecute these people uh, and put them behind bars. Uh, they, what they've done, as you described, is, this, is, is just despicable. It's, it's affected our country in ways we can't even calculate uh, and often can't comprehend. Um, the impact has had on lives and on the country as a whole. And so these people need to be prosecuted. But importantly, Michael, I think also we, we do have to think about whether we run the risk of this continuing, because some talk about state capture as something of the past. I don't think it's something of the past. I think it's something continuing. It is happening real time. Why would it suddenly stop? All those plans being developed um, the culture within business leadership, South Africa, for example, and their members of, of seeing themselves as apart from the rest of society, because they're behaving as if they're apart from the rest of society, that you guys can worry about corruption and ethical behavior, but we've got a different standard for ourselves. That still continues. And so we need some serious action against businesses who have been complicit in, in the state capture. And, and the Zondo report mentioned some of them. I think we can see a lot more coming forward. But I, I want to see South Africa and, and, and business in South Africa for, for once in its existence, take its role in our society seriously. This proposal of, of giving money now to, to the NPA to, to improve their, their ability to, to conduct investigations is complete nonsense. Busa and Business Leadership South Africa should focus on their own members, root out the corrupt members, punish and sanction the corrupt members. That's the best thing business can do right now and clean up its own act, not with this um, superficial idea, this PR stunt of offering resources to the NPA. Leave the NPA. The government can fund them. Um, we need business to start taking their role seriously in our society and not see themselves as a part from the rest of us. All this negative publicity must carry some consequence for, for Bain & Co. back in the, in the United States. What's happening across the pond? I think it's the baker McKenzie probe? No, there's no... Uh, so baker McKenzie were the Bain's lawyers. Um, they were Bain's legal advisors and then supposedly conducted the independent investigation. Um, I don't know how your legal advisors also conduct an independent investigation. So um, what's happening in the U.S. is, is surprisingly little, uh, Michael. It's the media is quiet. It just shows how little of what happens in South Africa gets into the, into the U.S. media. The Wall Street Journal hasn't reported on this at all. I don't think any of the major U.S. newspapers or news channels have reported on it. So it's not in the public space in the U.S., uh, the, you know, I've been approached by the FBI and I've, I've had meetings with them. Um, so it seems that the American Department of Justice is doing something, but I'm not sure what, what that investigation's about and what, where the prosecution will follow. You must have learned by now that whistleblowers Timber Maseko and Johan from Lochrenberg's homes were broken into just days apart. Are you feeling yes. more confident about your decision to leave South Africa and how are you coping with that? Yeah, I th you know, I, it's so disturbing um, for me having learned about um, both Johan and Temba's experiences. We're on, we're on a WhatsApp group. We've got a WhatsApp group amongst all of us state capture whistleblowers. And so it was obviously shared there real time. Um, and that's the reality that whistleblowers live with every day. We live in fear every day. Um, and, and so my heart goes out to Temba and, and Johan and their families because that's just a terrible experience. We've got one of our state capture whistleblowers who's hired a bodyguard every time uh, they, they go out. We've got whistleblowers who don't live in their house, houses because of fear. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible indictment, isn't it, on our, on our society that we have these people 
who we call heroes and we thank them and we pat them on the back, yet we explicitly abandon them and leave them to fend on their own. I'm still as shocked, Michael. I'm still amazed that with all we know, the president does not, or someone in government hasn't ever contacted me. I've never received an email, a text message, a phone call, um, asking me if I'm okay, asking me if there's everything, anything I need, um, nothing at all. There seems to be this explicit, intentional uh, willingness to leave us exposed and abandon us. So for me, I'm, 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 I feel vindicated for leaving because I, I knew I faced that same risk. How are you coping, Mr. Williams? Let me ask you. Well, um, your, your listeners and viewers can look at me and decide if I've doubled the number of gray hairs um, in the short period of time. I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing okay, but that's because of my resilience. I, I'm committed to resisting state capture in our country. I'm committed to working towards an ethical society in South Africa. I want to be back home. That's where my home is. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm still fighting and I'm still staying strong as best I can. But the reality is my life's been ruined. My career's been ruined. I haven't had an income for two and a half years. Um, I've ripped my family out of their home and, and, and we've come to a foreign place. We have got no legal permanent um, or, or, or status. So I'm, I'm not happy. I'm sad for our country. I'm sad for, for our fight against injustice. But I will keep on my fight. I'm not, I'm not giving up. And this is what Bain has learned. This is what BLSA have learned. And, and all those involved in state capture must know that there are, there are people out there like me who are going to keep pointing. They might want to go into the shadows, but we will keep shining a light on their wrongdoing in those shadows until people like Bain uh, make full disclosure and make full amends. Ethel Williams, I'm going to finish off by reading a final extract from the report. The commission, quote, particularly wishes to express its appreciation to Mr. Williams for the evidence he gathered and placed before the commission, which revealed much about the interactions between Bain and Co and Mr. Moyane and Bain and Co and the president, former President Zuma, with regards to their plans for and the execution of the capture of SARS. He, Mr. Williams, rejected numerous attempts from Bain and Co to give him large sums of money in return for his silence. The commission highly appreciates his assistance close quote. And I'll say, as should all South Africans, thank you for your time, sir.